21st century cosmopolitan Malaysia, a land of variety and contrast. This nation of nearly 30 million is a richly woven tapestry of cultures and races. For centuries, people from faraway lands came to these shores by sea. There would be traders from the Middle East or Arab countries, India, China. Even on occasion, Europeans showed up. The history of Malaysia reveals how a diversity of people came to settle here, bringing their own customs and traditions, each contributing to its cultural landscape. And they also brought in important aspects of their cuisine. The cuisine of Malaysia tells the story of the country's colorful past and the heritage Malaysians share. I strongly believe you can tell Malaysian culture and history through his food. From centuries old Malay favorites to Chinese inspired street food. Journey into the very heart and soul of this country, a melting pot of many influences. Fusion is not 20th century. Fusion took place in the 13th and 14th century. Culinary Malaysia, a mouth-watering celebration of this multicultural nation. Malaysian food has shaped what we are today. It has the influence of all the historical things that have happened, all the traders that have come in, everyone that has come in and crossed our paths has influenced us in Malaysia. the capital of Malaysia. This is the cosmopolitan heart of this nation. A sprawling modern metropolis. At the start of each day, many Malaysians observe a breakfast ritual with a 600-year-old Malay favorite. Rice steamed in coconut milk, topped with a dash of sambal or chili puree, some cucumber, egg, and fried ikan bilis, a local variety of anchovy. Wrapped in a banana leaf, nasi lama is a Malay staple, and while it today has several variations, the basic dish has remained largely unchanged for centuries. I think it is simplicity in itself, three ingredients. You have the main carbohydrate, you have the protein, and then you have the vegetable. Malaysian cuisine expert, Carol Salvaraja, has been a food writer and celebrity chef for over 30 years. If there may be an authentic Malaysian cuisine, I consider it as nasi lemak, and it has been available from the 15th century, because we've heard of writers talking about this lovely dish, the simplicity of nasi lama, particularly its rice and fish combination, belies its prominence in the history of Malay cuisine. The core diet of an early Malay community would have been rice and fish. Rice would have been brought in through trade. For example, in the great Malacca kingdom, there were tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of tons of rice brought in every year from Java. Combine that with fish, that made up the basic diet. The popularity of fish amongst Malaysians continues today. It is estimated that they put away some two million tons of it each year. Peninsula Malaysia is flanked on either side by seas rich with marine life. Much of the country's supply of fish comes from the waters off its western coast 
an approximately 800 kilometer channel called the Straits of Malacca. Straits of Malacca played a very important role in this because it is very shallow, it has a high oxygen content, so it's a very important breeding ground for fish and other sea life. The Straits of Malacca not only sustained early settlers, but its strategic location also made it a thoroughfare for trade, putting Malaysia at an important crossroads. It acts as a funnel for trade between South Asia or India and East Asia, particularly China. And so if you want to move between China or Japan and India, you basically have to go through the Straits of Malacca. There would be traders from the Middle East or Arab countries, India, Japan, the Philippines, China. Trading wasn't the only activity along the Straits of Malacca. The abundant seas saw fishing communities thrive along the coast. These days, Pankow Island along the northern reaches of the Straits is still home to a fishing industry. Pankow is best known for ikan bilis, but a wide variety of other marine species are also caught here. Many of the island's 25,000 inhabitants depend on the fishing industry for a living. 22-year-old Nasri, or Captain E, is the youngest fishing boat captain on the island. He's followed in the footsteps of his father. Semalam you tangkap berapa? Ada? Malam ada juga sekian. Sikit lah? Kalau itu macam kena rajin sikit lah. Each day, boats head out to sea from Pankor's jetties at precisely 3 p.m. It's a competitive business. Everyone is intent on finding the best fishing spots. But overfishing is forcing boats to venture further out than before. Life at sea may look tranquil, but it is hard backbreaking work. <laughs> Captain E is doing the same thing generations before him did. It's a legacy that stretches back to the earliest known fishermen in these parts, the Orang Laut. The Orang Laut, or Sea Peoples, basically dominate the ocean. They have knowledge of rare products in the ocean. They have knowledge of the shoals, the currents, the shallows. And therefore, they're able to move over water, or particularly the Straits of Malacca area, uh, with ease. Fishermen like Captain E rely more on technology than the intimate knowledge of the sea their predecessors possessed. Despite the high-tech gadgets available, Captain E and his crew still turn to a more traditional method to drive fish into their nets. They make noise. It takes far less time to deploy the nets than to reel them in. This must be done with care to avoid snagging the nets and losing the catch. How big that catch will be is anyone's guess. The sea, it appears, is smiling upon them tonight and they pull in a sizable catch. This time they've landed a school of mackerel, 
a fish popular with Malaysian seafood lovers. Bak sama tadi lagi pun ikan pun liar kan. Ha lagi pun ayam pun ada pusing-pusing ayam pukat jadi kemek kan. Ha yang ni pasal pukat pun cantik. Ikan pun banyak jinak sikit kan. Ha tu boleh kena banyak oh. By daybreak, Captain E's crew would have hauled in nearly 4000 kilograms of fish. They head back to shore with the ship's hold near capacity. Hello. Tonight's catch includes ikan bilis that will eventually end up in kitchens across Malaysia. At Chef Sinos in Kuala Lumpur, deep-fried ikan bilis is but one choice of ingredients for nasi lemak. Modern-day versions of the dish see items like fish cake, shrimp and fried chicken wings being used as well. But they're all interpretations of the traditional recipe served in nostalgic settings. Saya nak customer saya selesa waktu makan dengan irama 50-an, awal 60-an dan tengok gambar-gambar tu seolah-olah uh, dia akan kembali ke masa yang lampau waktu dia anak-anak tu kan. That walk down memory lane at Chef Sinal's ultimately leads to good old-fashioned nasi lemak. Okay, prinsip saya bagi nasi lemak ni senang, simple je. Kita kekalkan yang lama, tradisi tradisi kita tu, kekalkan. Resepi dia kita maintain, dengan itu kita boleh berjaya kalau kita buat perniagaan. Nasi lemak ni memang tuan pun murun kan? daripada nenek moyang dan merupakan uh, resipi ibunda kita. The nostalgic ambiance here is perhaps an apt setting for Malaysians to savour a culinary favourite from the past. One that is as popular today as it was in the 15th century. In the far north of Peninsula Malaysia, along the Straits of Malacca, lies a Chinese heartland, Penang. Over time, waves of immigrants from China came and settled here, bringing with them their own traditions and culture, and of course, their cuisine. Helping turn Penang into a street food paradise. The variety of food here is as staggering as it is mouth-watering. This is El Fresco Dining Malaysian style. And one of the stars here is a noodle dish called Cha Kui Tiao. Cha Kui Tiao is the flat rice noodles tossed with bean sprouts, with uh, cockles, with chilli, with garlic. It may be a dish we are eating in the roadside mainly or cooking at home. But it is very important because all of us long for that Cha Kui Tiao. <laughs> The Penang Food Festival is a celebration of its street fair. Food takes centre stage, with chefs' creations scrutinised by experts. The best Cha Kui Tiao award is up for grabs. In true Malaysian form, this Chinese dish is enjoyed by non-Chinese as well. We love Cha Kui Tiao. The, the taste. taste, the color, the ingredients. Voila! <laughs> Cha Kui Tiao is a national dish in my opinion because you know a lot of people wake up and the first thing they want to have is Cha Kui Tiao. At 
the Battle of the Chefs, judges look for flair and presentation, and taste, of course, to decide on the best Cha Kui Tiao. The highest points, ladies and gentlemen, for our Binang Cha Kui Tiao goes to Mohamed Faisal bin Zainal Abidin, also winning a bronze medal today. Yeah! Early morning in downtown Penang. The markets are already bustling. Cha Kui Tiao cook Mr. Lien and his wife are doing their daily marketing. And as any chef knows, the right ingredients make all the difference. Lian is the second generation of his family to make a living selling this Penang favorite. 我九歲已經幫我父親盤果雕。我的父親從小他就跟他的父母親從中國、附中那邊來到馬來西亞。那時候他的年份應該是1938年。所以傳到現在輪到我們已經是算是第三代在馬來西亞。For hundreds of years, the Chinese had come to the peninsula seeking opportunity. But these numbers swelled after the arrival of the British East India Company in 1786. When the British established Penang, or founded Penang, uh, uh, based on an agreement with the Sultan of Kedah, their, one of their main goals was to have a free trade port in this region. Penang became a major trading port and commercial center, and like a beacon, it attracted even more Chinese than before. While there were Chinese in the Malay Peninsula prior to the colonial era, they played a very important role in, in the societies and in trade, the amount, the volume, the numbers of migrants that came during the colonial era simply dwarfs that of those who came before it. Most came as traders, coolies, or laborers, bringing with them their way of life. <laughs> Many of those early immigrants made this new land their home. <laughs> Lian has done well for himself selling Cha Kui Tiao. It's a competitive business, but Lian has mastered the tricks of the trade from picking the right ingredients, to wok temperature, to frying technique. The cha kui tiao is hawker food, it's sweet food, and it's fast and furious. That wok has to be exactly really hot, the flame has to be really high, and it has a very, very high turnover. It probably tells us a little bit more about the Chinese who came. The Chinese were very, very efficient, and they were astute businessmen, they were entrepreneurs, and they were effective as traders as well. This dish has become very much an icon for a lot of the Chinese. The Chinese have come to Malaysia with loads of business skills and done well. Chao Guo Diao in Bingcheng is really very rare. Not many people have been able to eat in Bingcheng. There are many people who have been able to eat in Bingcheng. Every day, they have been able to eat in Bingcheng. They have been able to eat in Bingcheng. They have been able to eat in Bingcheng. But even before Penang, the Chinese already had a significant presence on the peninsula in a mighty kingdom that reigned 200 years earlier called Malacca. 
Malacca was a, a very important trade port because it was one in which a variety of international groups came to live there and visit, particularly in the 15th century. But it's generally accepted that some 100,000 people lived there in the 15th century, which would have made it one of the largest cities in the world. Traders from China came and settled at the thriving port city of Malacca in the 15th century. Over time, intermarriage between Chinese men and local Malay women would give birth to a unique hybrid culture, Peranakan. The Peranakan way of life was a blend of Chinese, Malay and sometimes Western influences. The Peranakans, also sometimes known as Nonyas and Babas, were a group of residents of the Strait Settlements who had uh, lived there prior to colonial rule. They generally descended from Chinese uh, migrants who married local women, but they kept marrying into Chinese migrants to maintain the culture. And so a lot of the culture focused around the women because they were the stable line that stretched back uh, through generations. One of the greatest contributions Peranakans have made is to Malaysia's cuisine. Ada ikan terubuk. Terubuk tak ada hanya dia. Anak. Ah. Anak. Anak boleh cucu. Marsha Tan and her daughter Lynette are fourth and fifth generation Peranakans. Peranakans have their own lingo, a blend of Malay and a Chinese dialect. Today they are shopping for their restaurant in downtown Malacca. In the kitchen, in true Peranakan matriarchal form, Marsha is showing Lynette the ropes. Dia harus buat ketuk ni buka lock dulu ingat ni dia punya ni semua jangan masuk dalam. Ini jangan masuk dalam nanti orang makan kena tercekik sekarang ni. The nutty slightly bitter tasting buah keluak is the seed of a tree found in Indonesia and parts of Malaysia. It is poisonous and can only be sold after being properly treated. Buah keluak dishes may not be easy to prepare but they're still the favorite amongst many Peranakans. The preparation the long hours of boiling and the chances they take to eat the buah kulua with the ayam buah kulua recipe shows you that these people are careful, they are exciting, they are willing to take chances. Tonight, the Tans are entertaining family and friends. The convivial atmosphere is typical of Peranakan gatherings, as is the spread of perennial favorites. This spread offers a range of tastes, from spicy to sour to sweet, a reflection of the colorful fusion heritage of the Peranakans. They are feisty, they are adventurous people, and they love life, and they love their food more than anything else. This is what the Baba and Nonya live for. The Peranakans have made a lasting impression on many aspects of Malaysian life, from architecture to fashion. A lively chapter in the story of the nation's cuisine. Friday prayers in Malaysia. Muslims make up more than half the population here. It is the last day of Ramadan, 
a month of fasting observed the world over. In markets across Malaysia, families are preparing for the customary end of Ramadan feast. This celebration is called Idil Fitri, a culmination of the month-long fast that symbolizes patience, austerity and faith. For Puan Sabaria and her sister, the day has only just begun. Preparing a feast like this for family and guests is quite a responsibility. Jadi kita sebagai keluarga yang tua, bila meriah kita mesti buat persiapan kan. Bila, kalau kita tak buat persiapan, mereka nak meriah apa, tak ada apa pun nak makan kan. Jadi kita terpaksa berkorban diri lah. The Idol Fitri Feast will feature their most beloved dishes. And leading the lineup, the all-time favorite, Beef Rendang. Tender cuts of meat cooked in thick, spicy gravy. Rendang is to the Malays what Turkey is to Christmas. And the Malays, mainly Muslims, uh, serve this wonderful dish at Idol Fitri, which is the end of fasting month, where everyone celebrates. At Puan Sabarias, preparing the Idol Fitri feast is a family affair. There are about 10 dishes on this year's menu, so everyone pitches in. Yang nama rendang mesti ada. Memang orang Melayu kalau hari raya memang ada rendang. The beef is cut into small chunks and left to absorb the flavors of an aromatic mix of herbs, spices and fiery chili known as rempah. Rempah dia bawang, putih, halia, lengkuas, serai, tumbar, jintan-jintan semua kita blend semua, kita tumis dia dulu. Nak pindahkan ni, pindah sana, piuk tu taruh sini. Ah, ada air malam, ada air malam. The rendang is very uh, much a family dish because everyone has to come together. It's the extended family coming together. And from that you can see that uh, the Malay culture and tradition is very family oriented and uh, the rendang is part of this tradition and everyone has a little say, so everyone has their job to do. The rendang is cooked slowly over several hours to reduce the gravy to a thick consistency. It is left to simmer as other dishes are prepared. It is at gatherings like this that age-old Malay traditions, including family recipes, are passed on to the next generation. I believe children should be involved in cooking and should know how important the knowledge of cooking is. will make them carry on with them the culture, the cuisine to the future and teach their children. Celebrity Chef Sam is the host of Ole Ole Chef Sam, a half-hour TV program that showcases his culinary skills. Ah, jadi hari ini kita nak masak. Kalau kau anda perhatikan, Vini tengok, Lily tengok. What is this? Ah, daging. Ah, daging. Ini dia daging lembu. Jadi tak sah kalau ada nasi minyak. Today he's taping an episode teaching kids how to cook beef rendang. Tapi pedas ni tau. Lily, can you taste spicy food? Cannot. Cannot? Why cannot your Malaysian? In Malaysia, food is so important, so significant. And because of that, we celebrity chefs are riding on the popularity, on the importance of food to Malaysian. And it's smelling wonderful. Ah. Ah. Back at Puan Sabarias, the rendang is coming along, slowly. It can take seven to eight hours before it's ready to be served. Well worth the wait 
for a dish that's long been a popular offering on the Malaysian. Well worth the wait for a dish that's long been a popular offering on the Malaysian menu. Why we think in Malaysia that the rendang is in Malaysian, truly Malaysian, it's orig it has origins in uh, Indonesia. There have been uh, writings and there have been recipes, ancient recipes of rendang uh, made in Sumatra. The traditions of our, our rendang come from some of their recipes, but we skew towards a more creamier, richer flavour of rendang with more onions and more coconutty aromas and flavours. It is said that the original recipe for rendang comes from an ethnic group in Indonesia called the Minangkabau. Over time, their influence extended across the Straits of Malacca to Malaysia. But there is yet another foreign flavour in rendang as we know it today. One that came from thousands of miles away. To break down rendang even further, let's look at the, the influences. Indian influences of cumin and fennel have always been in Indian curries, as well as coriander. These were the, rest, the ingredients for the rendang. Bearing spices and other commodities, Indians arrived in this region overland and via the Straits of Malacca. Indians came here prior to the colonial era uh, in search of trade opportunities mainly. Many of them were merchants and the ships coming from various ports in India, they would bring in cloth from India, for example cloth was very important, but they also brought in important aspects of their cuisine. In the culinary melting pot of Malaysia, some of these Indian spices would end up giving local dishes an aromatic flavour. It is the morning of Idil Fitri, the culmination of Ramadan, a month of fasting, austerity and sacrifice. In Muslim homes, younger family members ask for forgiveness from older folk. Then, a prayer of gratitude before the feast. It took many hands, many hours to prepare, with a dash of rich history for flavour. With many influences, the Idil Fitri feast has become a familiar Malaysian experience, a testament to the diversity of this melting pot. The serene outskirts of Saramban town, south of the nation's capital. A world removed from the din of the city. Mornings here in the midst of nature are quiet, except for Mr. Segarin. Sagarin and his men head out to a nearby jungle to harvest something that is an important feature of the typical South Indian meal. I am a wholesale supplier of banana leaf to the Indian restaurants. Approximately, we need 80 to 90 bundles a day. Go, 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 When you go to restaurant, you sit and eat like this. Rice, and you can put seven vegetables there. Chicken, mutton, everything, but you won't run away. Your wish, lah. Sagarin is a fourth generation Malaysian Indian. For hundreds of years, it was mostly migrant Indians who worked the many plantations that sprung up all over the peninsula. Hey, mana mana kudu ang ba? Takde na yar anjig ato pote veli ayro. Indians had also been present in the Straits of Malacca area for many centuries. Uh, however, during the colonial era, they came in 
far larger numbers. And part of the reasoning for that was it was related to the British or the colonial economy. They were brought in to work on rubber plantations. They were brought in to work in the civil service for the British, particularly in these straight settlement ports of Singapore, Malacca, and Penang. Whoa, 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 whoa! These Indian migrants brought with them the tastes, flavors, and customs of home, much of which became part of the local cuisine. In aptly named banana leaf restaurants across the country, Malaysians of all races let their hands to the eating of banana leaves. A banana leaf that is biodegradable, it is antibacterial, and if it's dipped in water, it is malleable. It is soft, it can be folded. And uh, strangely enough, this idea of banana leaves must have come from India because the Indians always use banana leaves as uh, plates. But there's more to Indian food than just the banana leaf meal. Another popular dish in Malaysia featuring fish is an exotic fusion of Indian and Chinese influences. This is a popular market for fresh seafood in Kuala Lumpur. And this is Kadam, head chef at an Indian restaurant. He's very particular about choosing just the right fish for his house specialty. You must have the size of below one kilo. This is the best to cook the tender. And you must have the fresh, shining, not very dull. Your gill must be very red color. Chef Kadam came to Malaysia a little over a decade ago. He uses his five-star hotel experience to prepare an unusual dish. One that features a part of the fish that is usually tossed in the bin. I see this. Locally, they're selling a lot of uh, fish here curry here in a uh, stall and other restaurant. So I develop. Definitely, it's uh, what I'm cooking and here it's a little bit different. So I make uh, according here what the Malaysian taste, they like it. There to in a fish head or chuda, a clean bane, boil for no boil for no to The fish head itself is not Indian. Uh, the people in India do not eat fish head. Uh, the influence was mainly Chinese. The Chinese brought the lovely influences of fish head because the Chinese have always lived close to the edge. You were never quite sure about where you're going to feast or famine. So the head was always priced. Fish head curry is a fine example of Southeast Asian culinary fusion that is today enjoyed throughout the region. The fact that the Indians were astute enough to bring their fish curries and to make it a wonderful fish head curry made it a very interesting exercise because of course fish was plentiful in Malaysia and becomes a very exotic dish that the Malaysians enjoy today. At Passage to India, Chef Kadam's version of this iconic dish is one of the most popular offerings on the menu. This is fish uh, head curry. It's very popular in India. Try this today. You know, this is fantastic. Yes. A taste of culinary Malaysia in a unique dish that is today tantalizing the taste buds of locals and foreigners alike. Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia's capital. The varied architecture here hints at the different cultures that have shaped it.
Much of the country today is the result of immigration and colonization. And for this Malaysian, the British legacy is still very much a part of his daily life. He works at the Colosseum Cafe, a quaint, nearly 90-year-old restaurant. The Colosseum is a nostalgic nod to the days of the British Empire. These days, however, its clientele are Malaysians of all races. Head waiter Morgan is the third generation of his family to work at the Colosseum Cafe. Even after more than 35 years, he still gets a kick serving the cafe's signature dish, the sizzling steak. We want to see the steak is really cooked and put in the hot plate. Maybe put a sauce, make the thing smoke very heavy. So the customers are very shaky and say, oh my God, oh my God. The Western food served here has a distinctly Malaysian twist. The recipe for the sizzling steak that nobody can copycat from us, which we did from since 1921 till now, the same taste as what customer likes it. Many of the items on its menu may not have changed. But the clientele today is quite different. The people who frequented the Colosseum Cafe would have been British civil servants who, and their wives and their families. It was a place where people could congregate and eat food that they were used to. Some of the Malaysians would also go there. Uh, it was also fashionable to be seen with the orang putih, the white man, and it was one step ahead in the social ladder. The Colosseum Cafe was established by a Malaysian Chinese businessman in 1921 to cater to the palates of the colonial masters of the time. But the chefs were Hainanese Chinese, as they are today. The kitchens were run by Hainanese cooks. These were a group of people who came from southern China, uh, coming in search of food because uh, at that time there were lots of jobs in Malaysia and Singapore. And they learned very fast because they were good cooks themselves. Headwaiter Morgan is himself living proof of the Malaysian melting pot. When the first time I came for the interview, my boss gave me six weeks. You must learn your Highlanders if you know you are out of this place. So whatever it is, whatever they talk, whatever first thing I learned, all the bad words first. Back to the good words and they tell. Okay, come on, 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 a Chinese-speaking Indian serving Western food prepared by Hainanese chefs to a multi-ethnic clientele. Malaysia is not merely defined by its multiracial society. It is how these diverse races have blended and borrowed from each other that makes it unique. I strongly believe you can tell Malaysian culture and history through his food because if you look at all these years, you yeah, will have some sort of influence from other races. The Malays would uh, no, incorporate some Chinese ingredients into their cooking. The Indians would uh, incorporate some uh, Malay ingredients into their cooking and so on. Malaysian food has shaped what we are today. It has the influence of all the historical things that have happened, all the traders that have come in, everyone that has come in and crossed our path has influenced us in Malaysia. It crosses borders, it has memories. A true fusion of ideas and cultures. Malaysian cuisine is undeniably a heritage all Malaysians share. 
a colorful story of migrants, ancient traders, colonial masters, and the seas that brought them to these verdant shores.